So, we're going to be looking at the Bible. So this week, I got asked by somebody, it was Pentecost last Sunday, wasn't it? And we looked at Acts chapter 2, didn't we? Briefly. And we looked at the fact that, uh, obviously just the fact that when the Holy Spirit came, the people of God were doing nothing other than sitting and eating. Yes? And you'd be really grateful there are no oranges here today. For those who don't get that joke, I was throwing oranges on last Sunday at everybody. I haven't been sued yet. We're doing all right. And we looked at, we didn't look at the whole of Acts 2 because it wasn't, we know the story so well. Tongues of fire come, Peter stands up, gives the great, greatest evangelistic speech you'll ever heard in your life. And 3,000 people were added to their number that day. 3,000 people got baptized. 3,000 adults got baptized. That's, that's a large number. But it is a large number, but actually, did you know in proportion to the number of people, which was about 180,000, it's quite a small percentage really, isn't it? Just, just that we'd like to hold that. It's quite nice to know that, you know, this is not some radical, like literally virtually the whole city gave their lives to Jesus. It's still a small percentage, so there's still that battle going on. Anyway, so um, I was sitting here praying, wondering, what does the Lord want me to speak on today? And then I got asked the question, what happened after the day of Pentecost? What actually happened? What was the next thing in the Bible? So I thought, well, that's a good idea. Let's have a look. So let's have a look, shall we? In Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47, it says, so... So in 41, it's got those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day, about 3,000 in all. And then this is how it goes on. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshipped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity." all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Well, doesn't that sign idyllic? I read that and I thought, oh, that's idyllic, look at that. It's all going really, really smooth. They meet every day together. They sell their possessions, all of them. They share with everybody in need. They, they literally are always joyful and cheerful, according to that passage. Isn't it idyllic? Let's break it down a bit, shall we? So let's look at these four ideal moments. So first and foremost, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. So the apostles being part of the first 12 and effectively the, the overseers of the early church. Don't forget, this is the church just starting to form. And so the people devoted themselves to the teaching. Now that devoted meant they, they didn't just listen, but they actually applied what they learned. Does that make sense? You can come to church and just listen to me rabbit on or chuck oranges at you. But if you don't apply what's actually being taught, doesn't mean anything. So they devoted themselves. Now, I have to say as a pastor, please, thank you. Devote yourselves to the teaching. As it says in Hebrews 13, verse 7. As it says in Hebrews 13, verse 7. Come on. Some of you know this because I rabbit on about it nonstop. Obey your spiritual leaders. You're all quiet. They devoted themselves. And we know that if you look at verse 46, that in any given moment, they, they gathered together, mainly in the temple, because don't forget, that was their central place by a particular colonnade. And they gathered each day. So dare I say for us that maybe 
Sunday should be a good gathering to devote yourselves to the teaching of the apostles. Each Sunday. It would be nice to do it every day. Yeah, I do, you, you devote yourself to the Bible reading. That's good. We'll come to that, Denise, in a minute. Thanks. Don't jump ahead in my sermon, please. Give, give me a break. So um, Hebrews 13, verse 7. Obey your spiritual... Anyway. Um, and dare I suggest house groups. If you're not part of a Bible study group, join one. It's all gone silent. If you got to apply what they did then to what we do now. Now, it was regular in their society to go to the temple every day. Do you know why? Because they didn't have Netflix distracting them. They didn't have these things keeping them occupied. Because obviously, these are really important. I mean, to keep up with the latest YouTube clip is really important, yeah? The latest Apple news that comes online, really important. So they would, and you know, they, they sacrificed watching TV. It was amazing. Would go to the temple. Repeats of Fraser on Channel 4 on a Sunday morning they didn't get involved in. They actually went to the temple. It's amazing. I mean, that's sacrifice, isn't it? You're all giggling. You're all going, oh, right, he's right. So they went to the temple every day to listen because they were hungering genuinely after the Lord. So it wasn't they listened to the Jewish teachers, they listened to the apostles' teaching in a colonnade. You could gather in various places. So imagine this is a colonnade, just for a moment. This, this one that's getting finger marks already. This is a new wall. For... Anyway. They would gather around a, like a colonnade and they would gather and they would listen. Wouldn't it be good? Yeah? Do you get the point? So we don't di quite do that because we have those incredibly excellent things called Netflix. Mobile phones that clearly should distract our lives completely, yes? They should, yeah? Thanks, Akin, yeah? The, the Amazon Echo or Alexia or whatever her name is. I mean, clearly she is the god of... Of the household, yeah? No, but strange how we devote ourselves to it. Anyway, can I suggest, we clearly in our society, it is very different in the way that things are. And we can't always gather in a temple every night. Well, we could actually. We could. There's no reason why we couldn't. You're right. There's no reason why we couldn't. Well, that's shocking you all, isn't it? You're all like, oh, hang on. But we all recognize we work. People work shift patterns. People work 24-7. People have families. People have different ways. Our society is slightly made up differently. But I would suggest that we can devote ourselves to teaching by actually maybe attending house groups, reading our Bible every day, listening to clips. If you can't make church, most sermons are online. Just think about it. This is the early church. We went, oh, it's idyllic. Well, it starts with us. If you want the ideal church, it starts with us. Anyway, next thing they did. They devote themselves to the apostle teaching and to fellowship. Fellowship. Now, what was the one reason? That, did you hear what I heard? The key reason why you're all here this morning was to, which is basically getting together in Christ's love. Fellowship's a nice big word, but it's getting together. It's having tea and coffee. It's not just here on a Sunday morning, but it's about maybe even walking with someone in North Isle Fields. Fellowshipping is about spending time with each other in God's blessing. It does not mean you have to do it in one big mass group. Sometimes you don't have to, when you're walking with a brother or sister in Christ, be talking about the Bible. You can be talking about life stuff. But it's about being in relationship with each other. Does that make sense? Now, of course, cool, you're not going to be in relationship with someone you don't have a massively common interest with, but you would be in relationship with each of us, and sometimes we have to show love to each other. So they did that. So they spent time being together. We're very good over here of, um, well, it depends on what culture you're from. Some cultures are very good at just suddenly rocking up to somebody's house and you just walking in and being invited in, Yes. Other cultures, Gatling gun, why are you here? But it is true, there are certain cultures that got it just right, that got it biblical as far as I'm concerned. There are other cultures, 
My drawbridge has raised. You do not come near my front door without my express permission. Why are you just dropping off at my front door? What do you mean you want to come in for a cup of tea? What do you mean you want to eat? Those sweets are mine. You laugh, but anybody else from my culture, you'll get it. It almost feels like when there's a knock on the door, what is that interruption? How dare you? Yeah? Where others, knock on the door, come on in. Now, it's okay. Don't panic. I'm not sitting here saying you can't come. Well, no, you can't come knock on my door. Um, Because my three cats will scream at you. No, no. Um, I'm being funny in that. But I'm just saying we've got to be careful. You know, part of fellowship is, is allowing ourselves to be opening, to be welcoming. It's called hospitality last time I checked. And that's what they move on to the next one. So they're sharing in meals here. They're not just sharing Sunday lunches. But they're also breaking bread. And, and by the way, I know it says in this translation here, including the Lord's Supper, that's a little bit, we're not quite sure if they quite meant the Lord's Supper there in that passage. I, I feel that, that's why it's in the NLT, it's in brackets. Um, not quite sure, but what they most certainly did was share in meals. So what did we do last week? We shared a meal, didn't we? And it's the same thing here. Now, tea and biscuits are okay. It doesn't have to be some big exotic meal round your house if somebody wants to come round. Unless it's me. If it's coming round, I want a big exotic meal. It doesn't have to be. But it's about sharing of food. Because actually, when you invite somebody to your table, back in their culture and in ours, it's a big deal. If you're welcoming somebody to your table, you are literally saying you are welcome, welcome, in the deepest sense of the word. I'll be up front, British culture are very good at turning around and going, after about five minutes while you're in it, oh, would you like a cup of tea? And it's done in a, please say no. (laughs) And the relief that comes over some British people when they go, oh, you just want water. Oh, thanks. That's quick. That's easy. That means you're going to be out fast. You haven't got to wait for the tea to cool down. Now, if you're a white British like me and you're laughing your head off, be shamed. Because you go to around some of the other brothers and sisters here, you turn up, they want to feed you up a full meal. Even if you might be full already, you accept. Because they are welcoming you to your table. And we all should be able to welcome people to our table. Now, you don't want me cooking, because then you'll be welcomed in by the Ealing Hospital afterwards but you are more than welcome to the table. But I'm being serious. Part of this early church, this idyllic, was actually they devoted themselves to teaching first. So they listened to what God said. Then they fellowship, which meant they just sometimes spent time together. Other times they shared meals. They invited and welcomed people into their homes and said, welcome. They actually made a point of expressly probably inviting people. Yes? And we can do the same. This is the ideal church, folks, the interaction. And then the last thing here, and to prayer. Now, have you noticed in the way that this is listed out, it starts with listening to God first. It's then having twice in the middle spending time with fellow human beings, and it ends in this, praying to God. So God is top and tailed in the church. That's the whole point. It's written in a particular way that it seems to show to me that God is top and tail, yes? Alpha and omega, beginning and end. And they devoted themselves to prayer. Now, the Greek here is actually plural. It's actually prayers, as in set prayer time. Don't forget, these are Jewish converts, yes? So they would have gone to the temple at set times for set prayers. I know we think somehow this is unique to uh, to other, co- well, like Islam, for instance, we think it's set. But they drew, let's just say it's equal to what happens in the Old Testament. Set prayer times, okay? And so they would have carried on with that routine because there's nothing wrong with the discipline of making sure you're spending time with the Lord. Now, I am not suggesting we start now setting times, but at you know, all through the day. But I would suggest that maybe for some of us, we need to be a bit more disciplined in when we decide we're going to pray. Not just get up, get on with the day and loosely chat to God at some point. 
and actually say, do you know something? I'm going to get up and I'm actually going to spend 15 minutes with the Lord this morning before I get on with the day. And then maybe lunchtime, I'm going to fast and actually I'm going to spend that time worshipping and praising the Lord and praying to him. Do, do you see what I'm getting at? Or not doing the very good thing that I did for early years, my Christianity. I'm just about to go to sleep. Let me quickly say thank you, Lord. <laughs> You're laughing, but a lot of us do it. So they pray. So they do some set times. But we can also hear, see here that in verse 47, during their praising, they clearly invoked the idea that they prayed for each other's needs as well. So they spent time together praying for each other's needs. Are we enjoying this ideal church so far? So I would suggest to you, what can we do to continue on praying? Well... Set times of prayer. Last week, um, if you may recall, we, we, for some of us leading weeks, we signed up to praying overnight. We take an hour slot and pray overnight. We're going to be doing that again later on in the year. Prayer tower, 8 o'clock, Monday evening. It's back. We can use it. It's, for those who don't know, behind that white door is a set of stairs that takes you up to a room that we call the prayer tower. Currently, I think there's the grand total of three people. Eight o'clock for an hour, praying for the church, for the community. Well worth it, yeah? And maybe also, when involving praying for each other, maybe coming together in prayer triplets. Some of you already are, I know, in prayer triplets. You, you, you meet with people and you pray together. And these days I've learned through modern technology, sometimes this is useful, you don't need to actually do it fate together together. Some people actually do it by Skype or, or what's the other, FaceTime, yeah, or whatever. Because recognize that some people work away from Greenford during the week. But you can communicate by prayer with this. This is not all evil. It can be used for good. So the ideal church, devoted to the apostles' teaching, devoted to fellowship with each other, devoted to sharing meals and basically showing genuine love and care for each other. And you do that by praying as well. I thought it was quite interesting. This is how the church formed, and this is how the church should be today. So I looked at this, and I thought, what's the overarching theme of those four things? Can you see it? Unity. They were unified. They were unified in their devotion to the Lord and their devotion to each other. Now, I am not going to sit here and say that relationships weren't probably fractured in this. But the point was they were unified in the Lord and they were working towards things. I'm not saying we're fractured here. Hear me carefully. But what I'm saying is it is unity that kept them bonded together. And our society is very good. I laughed about the TV stuff and all those and these phones. But these keep us fractured from people, don't they? Whenever I go on public transport, and I really don't like public transport, but I'm amazed. You plug this in your ear roll, or you're like this, you ain't seeing anybody else in the room or on the bus. There's no unity there. And the problem is that invades us, my brothers and sisters. And that's just one example of how we're no longer unified because we're too individualistic. We stare at this and not connect with each other properly. Does that make sense? Unity. And as Peterson puts it, Luke is giving a description of the ministry of these disciples to one another in a variety of context, not simply telling us what happened when they gathered for what we would call church. Two hours together on a Sunday morning isn't a unified fellowship. Connection time for 45 minutes isn't fellowship. It's what we also do through the rest of the week with each other. When somebody's down, got problems going on, what they want to do, they want to hear from other people in the church. When life is going great, you want to hear from other people within the fellowship. 
It's unity. It's what holds the church together. So no matter where they met, whatever context or time of the week, they met in unity together. One accord, as it's called in the old terms, yes? Or Honda, if you're... Nobody got that joke? Do you know I should scrap car jokes? Nobody gets them anymore. Honda Accord? Fine, forget it. But they are meeting together, unified, devoted to God and to each other, which then leads to this in verse 43. When they met in this unity, a deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. I want us to concentrate on this concept of meeting in a deep sense of awe. Awesome. That's awesome. No, am I? Nobody hears that out there? Man, that's awesome. Dare I say, OMG, that's awesome. No, that's something to do with Love Island. That's not awesome. I don't watch it but I just know it makes the trash press of just about every three seconds, doesn't it? Or suddenly a new movie comes out and we go, oh, that's so awesome. Such an overused word. There's only one that is awesome. And that is our... I, I, I looked at this and I thought, yeah, awe. When we meet to God, we meet in awe of him. Does that make sense? Um, the core Greek word here is phobos or phobos, which we get phobia from, which we get fear from. Yeah? Who suffers from arachnophobia? Yeah, one, thank you for your honesty. Fear of spiders, if you don't know. Who suffers from claustrophobia? There you go, see, yeah. Any other phobias we can? Yeah, don't ask me what, what, what it's called. I've just, can you think of other phobias? There's a lot of phobias in our society. Yet the word, the original word, in the way it's context, there's only one that we should be in fear of. And that's our Lord. But a right fear. A, a reverent fear, a sense of awe of this is our God. And this is what they did. They somehow met together, so they devote themselves to the apostles' teaching. They had fellowship, they shared meals and prayer, and they met together in this sense of God is God. He is the Lord. We should meet together in this sense that we are meeting under the holiness and reverent fear of our living God, yes? Does that? I would have loved it if somebody, I'm not having to go anybody at all. I would have loved it if somebody said, you know, we come to worship God, that's fine. But actually, if somebody turned around and said, I've actually come to meet together in the awe of our Lord. Because when we come to meet in of awe of who God is and what he has done for us, I don't think there's anywhere else we can go at that point. Do you, do you with me? It's hard because we just wake up every day and we just sort of say, oh, it's another day. But we meet together, we, whether it's a house group, a prayer triplet here in the prayer tower, here on a Sunday morning, meeting in a Costa Coffee or Starbucks or any other make an independent shop that might exist. Even meeting together in Tesco's. If you bump into each other in Tesco, Sainsbury's, Waitrose, Morrison's, Lidl, Asda, I've got to try and make sure I cover them all just to make sure I don't get done for false advertising. Aldi, Lidl, no, I did Lidl. Waitrose, no, I did Waitrose because Waitrose is great. Who goes to Waitrose? Anyway, no, moving on. Iceland, yeah, Iceland, that's a good one. Spa, co-op. No, we're not worried about boots. Nobody goes to the boots, Hannah. Hannah works for Boots, if you did. <laughs> so, wherever you meet, when you're meeting together, genuinely, you're meeting under the 
the awesome God that we worship. So even when you meet in Tesco's, the Lord is there. Not just over you, but within you and beside you. When we recognise how much we meet in the awe of the Lord, I think that would change our perspective and outlook and how we're coming together. I love laughter, yes? The Lord loves laughter. But we do that in also reverence of who he is. We meet in tears and crying. We do that under our awesome God. We have to meet the Lord and meet together in awe. And when that has come over the whole church community, wherever and whenever we meet, I think that's when they then say, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. It is about recognizing who God is. And when we recognize who he is in our midst, many other things can come out from that. Our love for each other will flow out from that. We will see signs and wonders and performing going on because we actually accept the Lord for who he is. Who's our holy. Holy meaning completely other. An awesome God. With me? It's like the story of Jesus. You know, in Jesus, he was able to perform lots of miracles and whatever else. But when he went to his hometown, he couldn't do very many. Why? Because they did not accept him for who he was. So therefore, then, that can't be honoured. If you don't accept somebody, if you, if you don't accept somebody, I don't know, if you don't accept me as the pastor coming into your home... That sort of authority as the pastor won't exist. Does that make sense? You know, you accept a prophet in your home home. If you don't accept somebody as a prophet in your own home, then, then no, no prophetic words are going to come out. And so it's the same thing here. If we do not accept how awesome truly when we come together our God is, then the signs and the miraculous doesn't happen. And I, that's what the early church done here. They were able to do that. So it carries on in this idyllic church. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their properties and possessions and shared the money with those in need. So first and foremost, verse 44, is basically they met in one place together. In other words, they didn't stop meeting together. Does that make sense? I... I it, it, I have to say, as, as, as a pastor, it does surprise me um, the amount of um, believers who, when they're going through trouble, don't come to church. That actually worries me that you feel you, nobody can come to church when they're going through really hard times. It's almost they want to avoid it all. It surprises me. This is the place where we are meant to meet together. Why? Because we meet under our awesome God in fellowship, devoting ourselves to each other. This is the place where we get our primary care. No? So it fascinates me. So they don't stop meeting together. And then verse 45. Now, I'm going to say this quite clearly. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. This passage has been abused. It's been abused to the point of saying, you should sell everything you have and give to the church so we can give to the needy. Now, that's not what they did. Let's make this clear. Because if they sold everything they had, what house would they live in? What house would some of these richer ones back then be able to welcome people in so the church could run? Because they didn't do the church in the temple. They did church in... A house. So let's make this very clear. This passage is, is about them selling parts of their land and maybe certain possessions. But people clearly kept their houses and their land because actually it's from the land that they grew the food that fed them and also generated their business, which generated money, which they could then give to the church or they could give to those in need. Do you understand what I mean? They said, you... you you, so you don't sell literally everything, everything. Because if you sold everything, we'll all be sitting here naked right now. 
Do, do you see what I mean, though? Do you see the difference? There has to be a tad called common sense that runs in here. But what the people did do, where they had spare stuff, which some of them, it was sacrificial. It's true we believe in cheerful, cheerful giving, giving cheerfully, but you also have to give sacrificially as well. Does that? It's got to be careful. It's very easy to say, oh, I don't feel cheerful today, so I'm not giving. Well, most of us don't wake up feeling cheerful most days, but we wake up sacrificially and get out of bed, don't we? Because we know we need to go to work to earn the money that provides the food that goes inside our stomachs and other people's. So here, they would have given sacrificially. Where somebody was in need, people would have met that need. Maybe heard the Lord say, sell that land. We're not going to go to Ananias and Sapphira in chapter 5, who tried to con the church. And they dropped down dead right where they were. Would we like that back in this church? No. But I just want to make that very clear. This gets slightly taken out of context. It, it gets used to make people feel guilty. And then it finishes off. They worshipped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. And everybody should say, Amen. So for me, out of this passage, what comes are very simply two things. Unity and awe of God. If you want the ideal church, and we want added daily to the number here, it is by our love for each other that Jesus said that they would know, we would know Jesus. It's by, they would know Jesus by our love for each other in the way that we love each other. Because it goes beyond just being nice. It has a sacrifice about it. It has about caving in to my desires and my needs. And it might even mean I've got to stop that Netflix program tonight because somebody needs me to spend time with them. Yeah? It's unity. It's spending time fellowshipping. It's spending time reading God's word and learning from it and acting upon it. Spending time praying together. We have prophecies. I noticed for the first time, it's, it's not up there because the screw needs to go in the wall. Church premises management team. And job number two. Um, Frank, you're listening? Oh, good. So, um, so I've got to list out a whole load of jobs I need doing. But it says on there, how can you listen if you do not pray together? How can you listen to God if you don't spend time together? And it's all running theme through all the thing, through the prophecies. God loves us being together. Believe it or not, he actually loves his children being together. So it's unity. And I said that second one, it's about being under the awesome presence of God, knowing he is Lord and he is holy. That's the ideal church. That's the ideal church. Has anybody ever truly found the ideal church? Over the years, I've heard, oh, well, that church doesn't really particularly suit me. Oh, did it? Oh, okay. May not do. It may not be the place for you to go to. But is it about you or is it about everybody else in the room? Is it about you or is it about where God wants you to be? Greenford Baptist Church is not the ideal church. For a starter, I'm here. <laughs> Second, you're all here. But what we do when we walk together under the awe-inspiring of our Lord and try to learn to walk in unity together, we become the ideal church. Amen? Amen? I was fascinated this morning by the story, uh, the songs that Hannah had chosen. She had no idea what I was preaching on. And that new, well, it's a new song to me. I've never heard it. That one, um, 
I just eat passage. I said, exalt the Lord our God and worship at his footstool. I went, that's it. That's in the awe of the Lord. Oh, come, let us adore him. Our God is an awesome God. Have we sung that one yet? I don't know if we sung that one yet. I don't know. We did, okay. Oh, yeah, we are going to do it again. But the whole point being is that our Lord is awesome. And when we come together, when you come together, maybe when you just meet up with one or two other people, come together knowing God is awesome. And just love each other. Let's bow our heads. Talk to God for a minute. Lord, Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for our early brothers and sisters. Lord, thank you for their passion for you. Their passion for each other. I ask, Lord, that same passion comes upon each and every one of us in the name of Jesus. How in each of our individual contexts, Lord, that works out is between us and you. But Lord, that passion of devoting ourselves to your word and listening to your teaching, that passion for showing love and fellowshipping and being hospitable to each other and that passion for prayer together Lord bring it for each and every one of us in the name of Jesus Lord give us a real real different sense of what it means to be worshipping and meeting under you the awesome God the awesome Lord who loves us so much that in your awesomeness you sent your son to die for us so that we have eternal life. Help us understand how much every day we're under your loving arms but awesome holy arms. In the name of Jesus, amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.